Okay, so Kyle um, is going to finish up the day on new technologies and applications. Thank you. I immediately regretted having uh, put myself after Lou. Uh, I don't know how you top a presentation like that. Uh, great speaker. So uh, you're, you're back to this at the end of the day. Um, so we're about we're 340 right now. I'll try to finish up by 440. Um, we got plenty of time before dinner, so I think you'll still have time to, to do whatever you're going to do, take a nap, take a run. So um, I was asked, well, I asked myself, actually. I was not asked. I, uh, I subjected myself to talking about uh, new technology. So this is, uh, you know, we had one more talk to put in. We wanted to give it somewhat of a radiation therapy bent to have some content here. And so I thought I would talk solely about flat panel CT, uh, which is a technology that is uh, quickly becoming adopted in both diagnostic imaging, radiation therapy, and then other departments. Um, we'll get through what we can get through. This is an incredibly complicated topic because it covers uh, reconstruction and everything. And I, I have no disclosures related to this talk. So we want to understand some of the differences between conventional CT and flat panel CT. Uh, we'll look at the role of flat panel CT in the clinic, understand how the systems operate, and understand how we can assess image quality and radiation dose. So first question, do we call it cone beam CT or flat panel CT? Well, cone beam CT describes any CT system where the cone angle is large. Uh, the cone angle being, you can think about it, the angle along the Z direction, the width of the beam in the Z direction. Flat panel CT describes a CT system that uses a flat panel detector. And so flat panel CT is a subset of cone beam CT. Uh, so anything that uh, applies to cone beam CT uh, applies to flat panel CT as well. So this is where we started with multi-slice CT. Uh, this is 4 by 2.5 uh, detectors. The cone angle is 0.6 degrees. So normal uh, filtered back projection algorithms work very well. Uh, for situations like this. But uh, as technologies advance, we've slowly increased the cone angle. For a 64 slice scanner, it's still about 2.2 degrees. The figure sort of exaggerates it. So, you know, there are some effects that start to be seen from the cone angle now. Uh, but when we move up to the 320 slice scanner, uh, now we have a, an almost a 9 degree cone angle. And for a flat panel CT system, the cone angle is about 14 degrees. And at large cone angles, um, the, uh, the, the most common uh, reconstruction algorithm, the FDK algorithm, um, you know, starts to fall apart and we have to put in corrections for the, uh, the cone angle, uh, the effects from that. And so you can see, in fact, the cone angle is almost as wide as the fan angle uh, in a flat panel CT system. Uh, so very wide. Uh, so I'm going to sort of run through the, the, the reconstruction aspects um, I had dinner with, with Jim Kofer last night, who's going to talk about reconstruction to, uh, tomorrow, I believe, right, in, in some detail. And so I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, and we'll hit on the high points, the differences. Um, so we're all familiar with um, um, parallel beam uh, CT image acquisition, uh, where the acquired projections fall neatly into sinogram space. Uh, and so this is a very simple reconstruction problem. Uh, it's a simple filtered back projection reconstruction problem. When we move on to fan beams, the reconstruction becomes more complicated. And there's two types of fan beams to talk about. One is equiangular, uh, where the angle between the rays is equal. And this applies to curved detector array. And the other is equal spaced, where the, uh, the, the, uh, the data are sampled equally on the detector array, but the angle between the rays is not constant. And this describes a flat panel detector. Uh, the reference I list down here in the bottom is an outstanding reference. It's available free if you Google this uh, uh, now. These, the authors have made it available uh, at no charge. And so we parameterize uh, fan beam CT instead of in the, the T theta that we saw for the parallel projections. In terms of beta, the angle that the ISO ray makes with the coordinate system uh, and gamma, the angle of an individual ray makes with the ISO ray. And so we parameterize it this way. And I just show this so we can understand because all the reconstructions are very similar, all right? So this is the formula for reconstructing uh, with an equiangular uh, fan beam acquisition scheme. 
the rays are scaled by the cosine that the ray makes with the iso ray. All right, so there's a scaling. Then the, uh, the scaled projection is filtered. So this is the filtering process we've all learned about. And then there's a weighting function that's applied to get to the final reconstructed image. And this weighting function is applied, and we can visualize this in this way. In a parallel beam reconstruction, all the rays are spaced equally throughout the sampled volume. In a fan beam acquisition geometry, the rays are more dense as we get closer to the source. And so you can see this weighting factor is 1 over L squared, where L is the distance from the source to the reconstruction point. So as we get closer to the source, that weighting factor becomes higher and higher because the rays are more dense, okay? This is exactly the same for an equal spaced acquisition, except we parameterize it by S, the distance from the ISO ray to the point on the detector where we're sampling it. Same thing, right? This is the cosine of the angle that the ray makes with the ISO ray. It's parameterized differently. It's filtered, and it's weighted by 1 over U squared, uh, which is essentially uh, the ratio of the distance uh, to the projected point on the ISO ray uh, to the distance to the ISO center. So again, scaled and weighted, same thing. And it's the same thing for a cone beam reconstruction. Instead of the, uh, the angle that the uh, ray makes with the ISO ray, it's a solid angle now, right? So we have uh, two angles, both the fan angle and the cone angle. So the samples are scaled by the cosine of that angle, and they're weighted by the ratio of the projected distance onto the ISO ray to the source to ISO center distance. So the reconstruction is the same, um, except in a cone beam reconstruction, we have to do it for all uh, the possible fans uh, within the cone. And then there can be some uh, reconstruction artifacts that are attributable to the non-exact nature of the cone beam reconstruction anywhere but the, uh, but the zero plane, uh, the plane that's perpendicular to the z-axis. So in conventional CT, we acquire data like this, right? Uh, we have a, a source, a detector array, and a collimated beam, and we scan the patient. This is as opposed to uh, flat panel CT, uh, where we have a giant detector array, and we do a single rotation around the patient, and in that single rotation, we acquire all our data. So dose is deposited differently in the patient uh, because of this. There's lots of implementations of flat detector CT on the market. I talked to someone at lunch about the O-arm system from Medtronic, uh, which is meant as a surgical guidance system. Uh, ICAT is one of the dental systems that's available. Uh, the interventional lab, every manufacturer of interventional equipment, every major manufacturer has an implementation. Uh, there's dedicated breast CT, um, and there's uh, onboard imagers on uh, Linux uh, for radiation therapy applications. Hopefully this thing doesn't have any sound on. There we go. And so this is just a picture of a typical acquisition in a flat panel CT system. And we can see a couple important things actually from this movie. So if we watch it again. Let me see if I can go back. Oh, look at that, in reverse. <laughs> so we see that the source and the detector, which are on the C-arm, rotate about this object. They don't rotate a full 360 degrees. Why not? The system isn't mechanically capable of doing that, all right, the way the C-arm's attached. If you rotate it to where it's parallel with the table, it spins like a propeller, and it can do a full 360 rotation. And so the acquisition geometry is a little different. We may have a limited angle acquisition, uh, which can cause unique artifacts. But that's a, a, a typical acquisition, and that, uh, that's the same for any implementation of flat panel CT. Um, it's just the hardware may be a little bit different. So... Key difference is, if we try to measure dose like we do and calculate dose like we do in conventional CT, it doesn't work very well, right? Because in conventional CT, we have a, a fairly narrow collimated beam of x-rays. Uh, a lot of the dose deposition is from scattered radiation, uh, and so it's fundamentally different. Uh, flat panel CT images differ in a lot of their characteristics from CT images. And this is because of differences in the reconstruction process and steps that maybe are skipped or not performed in flat panel CT. And the acquisition of the basis images differs from CT. So old CT, you set the KV, you set the MA, and you set the rotation time. 
and you scan the patient, right? And so you either set the EMA high enough to penetrate the thickest part of the patient or you set it to penetrate the average part of the patient and you had some noisy projections and your images were very noisy. The new CT said, hey, we don't have to keep the EMA constant all the time, so let's change it to deliver the same dose to the detector regardless of the thickness of the patient. That's a, a much better way to do it, right? So you get the dose you need at all the projections and it minimizes the patient dose and it maintains uh, the image quality that you're looking for. In flat panel CT, before dual energy CT came about, uh, there was the uh, automatic dose rate control scheme, right? So Phil talked this morning about how uh, fluoroscopes operate, and that's exactly the way that um, flat panel CT operates on, the, on our interventional implementation, is that the KV and the MA will change during the course of the acquisition to maintain the necessary dose level at the detector. And then, of course, now we have dual energy CD and care KV, which tries to automatically adapt the KV to the patient side. So there, you know, we finally got ahead of conventional CT. And CT reconstruction, I talk, Jim and I talked a lot about this last night. It's always presented in a very simple way, and it's, it's a very computationally complex process, right? You have a matrix, and you look at each pixel in the matrix, and you look at the interpolated sample data, and then you find which ray contributes to the pixel. You assign uh, some of that to the pixel, and you do this for all the pixels. And, you know, it's a very complex computational process that we don't often get into. Uh, and during the process, there are lots of things that happen to the data. We measure the projection data, and then the data are conditioned, and projection space corrections are applied to the data. Then there's the log transformation uh, that we apply in order to get at the uh, what we're trying to get at, which is to reconstruct uh, the attenuation coefficient map. Then the projections are filtered and back projected. This is the part we often talk about a lot. And then there's image space corrections applied, and then a CT number calibration that's applied. All right? And so there's many steps along the reconstruction process, and each of these blocks involves several sub-steps. And some of the key differences in flat panel CT images stem from the fact that maybe the images are not created in the same way, they're not conditioned in the same way, and they don't have some of the corrections applied. Reconstruction implementation is challenging because the cone beam reconstruction is exact only in the plane of rotation. Uh, and this causes artifacts in the axial direction. Data acquisition and processing is a tremendous challenge. So in a CT scanner, you might have 1,344 channels in the fan direction, 64 in the Z direction, and 1,160 projections in a rotation. This is about 100 million samples per rotation. Let's consider a 3 megapixel flat panel detector and you're acquiring 480 projections in a limited angle cone beam CT. That's 1.44 billion samples per rotation. That is a data acquisition and processing challenge if there's ever been one. Uh, so what they do, in fact, is we bend the pixels in order to reduce the number of samples that have to be acquired per rotation. And as Phil talked about, flat panel detectors, because of the additive electronic noise, don't perform particularly well in low-dose regions. And this is the classic graph that we always show. And so we also have to be conscious of delivering a certain minimum dose to the flat panel detector in order to get images of adequate quality because the noise level in a CT image is determined primarily by the noisiest projection data. And so we want to deliver the, the correct dose to the detector all the time. We can't rotate it too fast because we'll fracture the glass substrate uh, that the flat panel detector uh, is built on. And also, this is a really hard one, a C-arm flexes. A CT scanner doesn't flex. It's massive, and it, the geometry doesn't change during a scan. A C-arm flexes as it rotates around, and so we have to be very careful about geometric calibration as well. We use flat panel CT for a host of things, and we'll talk about these more as we go on. Uh, so some technical aspects of flat panel CT. Depending on the manufacturer, they operate differently. Our dental scanner uses a fixed KV, a fixed MA, and a selected dose level. Uh, our Dyna CT, you select a KV that may or may not be maintained. The MA varies. You select a dose level, and you select a filtration that may or may not be maintained. 
uh, the variant onboard imager, the service engineer calibrates it at a fixed KV, a fixed MA, and a fixed pulse width. And if you use anything other than that, then you're not guaranteed that your images are going to be of any use. And so different manufacturers take different approaches uh, to acquiring uh, flat panel CT data. And automatic exposure control is tube current modulation, and you're already familiar with this, right? Uh, so we know that modern systems operate under automatic exposure control, and so flat panel CT, our implementation in the IR lab, operates under exactly the same principle when the flat panel CT data are acquired, except it's also varying the KV if necessary. Bow tie filters. Uh, so I should have left this as a quiz. So a bow tie filter in CT has a, a variety of uses. Uh, primarily, it flattens the X-ray fluence at the detector array, and in doing so, it also reduces dose, especially at the periphery of the patient. Uh, because it adds filtration, it also improves uh, beam hardening, uh, and it also reduces scatter. Uh, so it has both image quality and radiation dose implications. Bow tie filters may not even be used in flat panel CT. Varian uses removable bow tie filters, one for the full fan and one for the half fan scanning mode. And uh, our Dyna CT uses no bow tie filter. Nobody's going to stop in the middle of an IR case, go slide a bow tie filter in, and acquire a study. And so it doesn't use a bow tie filter. And so there are some things, implications we expect uh, from this. But the other consideration is the fan angle isn't nearly as wide as it is in traditional CT. And so, uh, you know, there's not as much need for the bow tie filter uh, uh, in that respect as well. So, uh, so they may or may not use a bow tie filter. There are impacts from that. We also have a, a much smaller uh, fan angle as well. Uh, potential drawbacks include the need for multiple filters, uh, negative impact on dose and image quality if the patient's not centered, if you use a bow tie filter, uh, and artifacts from misalignment of the bow tie filter. I saw a nice presentation on that at the World Congress a few weeks ago on a variant system. Uh, flat panel detector, uh, each pixel, as Phil showed earlier today, has its own sensitivity and dark current. And so we, we use gain and offset calibrations. And we do the same thing in CT. Um, and so we, we do essentially a gain uh, and offset calibration. Uh, but in CT, uh, it's, done, uh, it's done every day, right? Uh, in flat panel CT, it may be done once a year. Um, in flat panel CT applications, this means that small gain variations in hundreds of projections will cause an artifact. How many have ever seen a ring artifact in a CT scan, right? So acquire a bunch of projections with one unruly channel, and it causes a ring artifact in the image. And this is exactly the same for a flat panel CT uh, scanner. And because we have a lot more pixels, they also, uh, uh, some manufacturers will apply a ring correction. And this is um, separate from the bad pixel calibration that's applied to the raw readout from the detector. A uh, nice example from Ian Yorkston about the image correction process. Uncorrected image on the left. Uh, the image in the middle has gain and offset corrections applied, log transform. And the image on the right has dead pixel correction applied. And so you see, this is what most of your detectors start out as, all right? This is how the image looks coming out of it. And then when we apply the corrections, we get the final image. Geometric calibration is very important for, uh, for C flat panel CT. Jeff Stewartson's group has done a lot of work on this uh, as they uh, build their image-guided surgery systems. So CT reconstruction algorithms, I showed you how they're parameterized. I showed you what they need to know. One of the things is the source to ISO center distance. It needs to know that a priori to properly weight the projections. And if that changes as the rotation angle changes, that's a huge problem for the reconstruction algorithm. And so a CT scanner has a rigidly fixed geometry that's known a priori. C-arms and Linux, on the other hand, have many degrees of freedom of movement, and they can flex. I'm sure a Linux doesn't flex, but a C-arm will certainly flex. And so all of these movements must be accounted for in the reconstruction. Uh, a, 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 a nice slide from Jeff Sewardson. I got his permission to use these. They're not in the handouts because they're not my figures, uh, especially ones from presentations. Uh, but I do give you the reference for the presentation. This shows a, a scan of a bead with a full geometric calibration. And then as you remove parts of the calibration, this is a knockout analysis to show you the impact on the bead. 
And so you can see it's drastic, the impact of the calibration, the geometric calibration. Uh, here it is in a head phantom, and you can see that if you just assume a semicircular orbit, your reconstructed image is filled with artifacts uh, because of the changing geometry. In fact, the variant owner's ma maintenance manual gives you this warning. A bad geometry calibration can ruin your day, is basically what that should say. Um, so this is done by using this type of phantom. Uh, it's a helical phantom with beads and a spiral around the phantom. The phantom is scanned using the cone beam CT scanner. And then the system knows if the phantom is positioned properly, where the images of the beads should occur in successive projections. And then based on where they actually occur, a correction can be calculated and applied to the data. This is an example from the Varian uh, maintenance manual of the plotted positions of the beads uh, versus the um, expected. And so the geometric calibration is calculated per projection based on these data. Varian also has the true beam uh, feature uh, that uh, it works in lieu of a geometric calibration or in conjunction with it uh, because it's, all, it's already accounting for the offset between the ISO centers of the different uh, capabilities. And so the impact of this means that most, no manufacturer that I know of supports 3D on II systems because that's another set of corrections. If you have a service event, a major service event, your room may be down for a long time to calibrate uh, the scanner and modes that aren't calibrated won't be available for reconstruction. So I suggest you minimize the number of protocols you use. Uh, the image on the left and the image on the right, besides the crappy appearance, do you notice any other differences? It's flipped AP. Okay? This is a scan from the same scanner with two different orientations of the CR. All right? This happened on a patient study. You do not want to have a patient study flipped left to right or up and down. Right? And so this was caused because the flat panel, instead of being perpendicular to the table was parallel during the calibration process. Somehow this still passed the manufacturer's calibration uh, or the service engineer just ignored it. And so this is what you end up with. And this is the impact of a poor geometric calibration. And if the number of, if you stop the scan uh, before it acquires the necessary number of projections, uh, you also get artifacts. So if you calibrated every available mode on our Axiom Artist system, ceiling mounted, that would be 15,120 calibrations. This is why you do not want to calibrate all the modes. It's, you have to calibrate the, for each dose setting, for each position, head side, left side, right side, available scan times, angular sampling, and that is a staggering number of total possibilities. Dose and flat panel CT. So this is a back of the envelope calculation I did once upon a time. This is for the 16 centimeter CTDI phantom. And so for a flat panel CT scan, uh, you see that the, uh, I call it the integral CTDI ball was 10.6 milligray to scan 18.7 centimeters of coverage. To scan the same coverage on a conventional CT scanner uh, with a clinical protocol was about 16.4 milligray. Um, and so, of course, there's differences in the settings, uh, but I try to keep them uh, similar clinical protocols. And so, in this case, uh, the dose from the flat panel CT scan was, was a little bit less. And uh, again, I mentioned we're doing it in a single rotation, and we don't have the continued buildup of scatter. Um, and I'll show you also, I uh, use one phantom and then two phantoms, uh, because one phantom uh, is, you know, just contained within the field of view, if you add another phantom, there is some scatter that you pick up, and so it's about 4% difference at the center measurement uh, compared to a single phantom. Uh, so, you know, it's been talked about a lot that with wide uh, cone beams and conventional CT, CTDI uh, is a metric that's falling out of favor. And so, you know, I would caution uh, all of those who, who use the, uh, these uh, effective dose conversion factors that were calculated for uh, 10 millimeter beam widths once upon a time, and now you're applying them to like 160 millimeter beam widths, this is a, we have a problem. Uh, but the, the moral of the story is for very wide cone angles, we don't collect hardly any of the scatter uh, that's generated by the phantom. 
Um, and in flat panel CT, this is even more of a problem because you can't even measure all of the primary radiation. All right? And so I would, uh, I would put out there that using a pencil chamber, you're averaging or you're measuring the dose over some arbitrary length. And so we, we move back to uh, something that's more along the lines of the MSAD, the multiple scan average dose, and we measure a point dose. So here's the situation in CT with a narrow beam width. We get most of the scatter. Here's the situation in flat panel CT. We don't even measure all of the primary radiation. And so we can put a bigger phantom, but that still doesn't change the fact that we're not measuring all of the primary radiation. And so we can put a point detector in and, uh, and start basing our dose measurements on this uh, sort of in, uh, analog of the multiple scan average dose. Uh, I'm sorry, we, we're measuring a lot of the primary. We're not measuring all the primary here either, but we're, we're measuring a, a point dose at the center of the phantom. And so, uh, of course, ta the report of task group 111 covers this methodology in gory detail, and I would refer you to this report if you're more interested in reading some of the, the details about dose measurement uh, with a point detector um, uh, for, uh, uh, for modern CT. And uh, there is a paper that applies particularly to flat panel CT uh, by Rebecca Farrig and Bob Dixon, and I must give this reference. Oh, there it is. I thought for surely I'd give this reference. So we have a non-uniform dose distribution dependent on the radius, the angle, and the Z, uh, position along the z-axis. And we want to measure the average dose at the center of the scan plane, uh, this MSAT analog. And so they use the same weighting uh, that's always been used. I put an asterisk because that may not be the best weighting for conventional CT. One half, one half has been proposed. And it's certainly not a great weighting for flat panel CT, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, we can use a therapy, therapy point. We can use a farmer chamber to use the... Uh, to measure the doses enough in, uh, to measure point doses when we're trying to perform dosimetry for these very large uh, cone angles. And so this is, in fact, what's mentioned in the uh, Task Group 111 report and what we use. I call this the Farrig-Dixon formalism. Uh, it's really very similar to measuring uh, CTDI 100, center and periphery measurements. Um, and your dose may vary, your results will vary based on the starting and ending positions of the scan if it's a limited angle scan. Uh, as I mentioned, on our system, on the left side and right side, the scan angle is limited uh, by mechanical considerations. So you get the 180 plus the fan beam. That's a requirement for uh, reconstruction with a fan beam. You have to acquire at least 180 degrees plus two times maximum gamma angle with the ISO ray, which is the fan beam width, in order to completely fill in sinogram space. The head side does have a 360 degree option for improved image quality. So for a limited angle scan, the dose is of course highest at the midpoint of the scan. And this uh, slide from Jeff illustrates that nicely. And this shows that as well. Here's the central dose, which doesn't vary. Uh, and here's the peripheral dose, which of course varies with position much more strongly than it does in conventional CT. If you wanna calculate patient or reference doses and your system operates under automatic dose rate control, you have to account for this because the KVP can change, all right? And with this changes, we have a major uh, adjustment uh, in, the, uh, in the, the fact that we're gonna use to calculate dose of the patient. John Anderson, again, his name keeps coming up. They presented a poster at RSNA in 2004 where they discussed this. And this graph shows exactly that. This is an oblong phantom uh, for a DynaCT protocol set for a relatively low KV. And you see, depending on the view number, the KV is varying. All right, and so if you have some dose factor you're applying, you've measured it at a single KV, you're not going to accurately uh, predict the dose of the patient. So this is what I call the Anderson formalism, where they calculate a 70 KVP equivalent MAS. And so they take the MAS for a given frame and multiply it by uh, the ratio of the KVP in that frame to their reference KVP weighted by this uh, factor that accounts for the difference in output with KVP. I think you mentioned it was about 2.4. Did I get that right? Okay. Uh, and so to calculate the dose from a scan, uh, you, can cal you can use the dose measured in a phantom at a single KVP, a circular phantom, times the sum of these correction factors for all the frames divided by uh, the MAS uh, for uh, the scan you just did for all the frames. And I'm sure if you asked nicely, John might send you a copy of that presentation. Sorry to, <laughs> to do that, John. Um, 
So when we, if we want to measure reference doses that we can use to calculate patient doses, then we have to be careful as well. So a 16 centimeter CTDI phantom is contained within the fan angle and we're fine. We can do that with confidence. The big CTDI phantom is not fully contained within the fan angle in that direction of the field of view. And so there's cutoff in the peripheral measurements. And so, number one, slight variations in the phantom position can result in large variations in your measurement, which you'd like to be repeatable. And then if you're going to calculate a weighted CTDI, what's the best weighting function? All right? And if you make a bunch of measurements in a bunch of intermediate places, you can come up with a nice weighting function, but more precise equals more measurements. Here's an illustration. This is to scale perfectly. The detector, the distances, the size of the phantom is all to scale. And you see, as I rotate around the phantom, if it's centered, I'm cutting off various peripheral points along the way. And so certainly you can measure this as some sort of you know, reproducibility thing. But if you really want to get at a, a patient dose using a CTDI W type quantity, then you're going to need to measure a weighting function that tells you how to better uh, predict the average dose to that scan volume. To optimize the dose, we have to do several things, and it depends on how our system operates. We want to select the minimum dose per frame necessary for the task, so the minimum dose level. We need to consider rendering methods. If I'm MIPing all of these images, I don't need really low noise images, all right? I've got high contrast. Know your equipment and read the manual. You've got to know how your equipment works to have a hope at optimizing the dose delivered to the patient to get the images you need. If your KVP setting is selectable, select it based on the attenuation of the body part being imaged. If you can select angular sampling, choose the appropriate angular sampling, and then remove unnecessary body parts from the field of view. Um, this goes to show the reason that KV selection matters, and Phil talked about this today as well. He had the data show it, you know, miraculously on all these systems. Uh, there's that minimum around 80 to 85 KV. And so if we look at an 80 KVP spectrum, uh, it's lined up fairly well with the, um, uh, the K-edge of cesium iodide. Uh, it's in the wheelhouse here. It's going to absorb it very efficiently. Whereas if we change it to 125, you know, a lot of this radiation... Uh, is not being attenuated nearly as efficiently as it is by the, um, uh, the, than the 80 kVp is. And so uh, the efficiency of the flat panel at those different energies uh, is the driving force behind this difference. So the operator may be able to select the desired input dose per frame. And like I said, in some implementations, you can select the target kVp. So this is some measurements on a 16-centimeter CTDI phantom with a very typical input dose per frame. And you see, this is the average dose with peripheral measurements. This is the center dose. There's a minimum right around 85 kVp. What do you know? Two of us measured essentially the same thing and got the same result because of the technology that's used in the flat panel detector. The peripheral to center ratio is a little different than it is in conventional CT. What's the peripheral to center ratio for a head phantom in conventional CT? About one, right? A little different in flat panel CT because the beam quality isn't nearly as hard. And it ranges from 0.5 to 2.5. Why is the range so large? Because it's a limited angle scan. And it depends on the starting point of the scan, right? So for our implementation that rotates under the patient, the dose at the 6 o'clock position is about 2.5 times the center. And the dose at the 12 o'clock position is 0.5 times the center. For the body phantom, we don't get much reduction by selecting a lower KVP because it's being driven up by the system to maintain the dose to the detector. And so you see this here. There's really no benefit except if you select a very high KVP. Peripheral to center is more like we'd expect uh, in conventional CT. And then I include some measurements here as well. Uh, so you see here um, the center uh, phantom dose was about 28.5 milligray for the Siemens implementation. For the normal pelvis protocol we have on our variant OBI, it's 14.5 milligray. Uh, and then the CTDIW is about 23 milligray. Uh, and there's also a low dose mode that for our system, for the variant, turned out to be about one third the dose of the normal mode. 
And so you can see here as well, uh, this is the table of the suggested default techniques for the variant imager. And so it's suggesting 100 kVp for the head protocol, which I didn't get a chance to measure, but you may suggest to your service engineer, hey, you know, I think if we drop that KVP a bit, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to reduce the dose to the patient uh, and get the same image quality. Uh, and so I noticed this, that this might not be an optimal setting, particularly for a head scan uh, with the variant OBI, which uses a cesium iodide converter, uh, just like the Siemens flat panel. Busy slide about all the possible configuration options in the variant OBI. Uh, you can't even, I can't even see this from here, so. Uh, additional resources related to radiation dose. Uh, the paper by Rebecca Farrig and uh, Bob Dixon and some other people. Uh, John Anderson's presentation from RSNA. And then this paper by Kiriaku and Will Callender uh, that talks about some concepts for measuring reference doses and measuring patient dose. Uh, in, uh, in flat panel CT. You know, I wanted to give you an overview, some basic information, some of the differences, and some strategies that you might uh, 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 use in your approach uh, to measure these doses. Image quality, you know, I always hate talking about image quality because um, no one ever seems to know what they're doing, right? Why, are, what are we doing, right? I mean, sometimes we're putting a phantom in and making some subjective measurement and not using the same setup year to year. And you've heard some of the speakers today talk about some of the things that they do uh, in order to assess image quality and do so maybe in a more objective fashion. Uh, but so I want you to ask yourself first, why are you measuring image quality? Right? Because I should? Because that's something I've always done? Right? So I was telling someone today, for fluoroscopy systems, you know, I image a line pair, but that's it. Right? I measure the KVP because that influences contrast very strongly. There are other indirect ways to get at things that affect image quality that are probably more quantitative than what we're doing right now. Are you trying to ensure constancy? This is certainly a valuable thing, right? Take a benchmark when you acceptance test the system and then compare it, right? You don't have to know much about what you're doing to do this. You just look for the same thing year after year. Are you trying to evaluate differences between systems? Here we have to be a little more careful about how the data are acquired. Are you trying to benchmark or create imaging protocols? Standardize clinical research. Compare against manufacturer specifications. In this case, you better use exactly the method that they used if you're going to go to them and say, hey, this doesn't meet your specifications. Are you trying to evaluate adequacy for a specific task? Replanning. Quantification. So now we have a more defined goal and we can get at this. We can figure out a way to approach this. So this is the trite graphic that showed all the time that talks about the factors that affect image quality, and it's exactly the same in flat panel CT. Um, I put a link to this presentation because, you know, I'm not going to pass it off as mine. This is Jeff Stewartson's presentation, and it's excellent, and I show it for this. Here he has an image example, and he outlines the reconstruction process. Remember that process we talked about earlier? Here's the raw image from the flat panel detector, offset and gain corrected. So the detector corrections are applied, log normalization and I0 calibration, we'll talk about this in a second, cosine weighting, different parts of sinogram space, uh, I'm sorry, the cosine weighting is what we talked about earlier, the cosine that the ray makes with the ISO ray. Parker weighting accounts for the fact that regions of sinogram space are sampled more than others, ramp filtered. That's the filtration we talk about. Apatization, which uh, tends to, to eliminate some of the high frequency noise. And then the back projection. So I show this because it's a beautiful illustration of the reconstruction process and what happens along the way. And I wanted to remind you about that because image quality is greatly affected by what is or is not done in the reconstruction process. So on a conventional CT scanner, every day, you're supposed to do the air calibrations. And so this is used for several purposes, uh, defective channel correction, uh, you know, normalizing the response of the channels, um, you know, uh, establishing the, the I0, the initial intensity of the X-ray beam. So this is done every day on a conventional CT, every day, all right? And I would keep that in mind. There's a CT number calibration that's done sporadically, where the service engineer 
scans a phantom, measures the CT number, puts it in the system, which then applies a shift to the, the reconstructed images to more accurately align with uh, the known CT number. There's reference channels at the edge of the detector array that correct for variations in the beam intensity as it rotates around the patient. This is to name a few. So all of these corrections and all of these um, adjustments are done uh, very frequently on a conventional... And beam hardening, I didn't mention beam hardening corrections. So very detailed measured beam hardening corrections. We have a Tinsu pan at our institution develop the beam hardening correction for GE. It's a nine-parameter beam hardening correction, channel by channel in projection space. That's why the images look so damn good, is there, there's so many corrections that are applied. If we look at flat panel CT, our service engineer comes in not once a year when there's a problem, when something's been replaced, and does the I0 calibration that's done every day on a conventional CT scanner. All right? Geometry calibration is only done when there's problems, if the images are poor, if something's replaced. There are no reference channels. The detector is fully covered by the patient. There's no daily calibrations. And on Dyna CT, there's no CT number calibration. And I show you this because this should already get you thinking about, wow, maybe that's why we see some of the artifacts we do and some of the discrepancies between flat panel CT images and conventional CT. Artifacts, cone angle artifacts. Uh, streak artifacts because of view aliasing. We're doing limited angle. Truncation, the field of view is small. Scatter. Think about the, G, the, the, the difference between CT and flat panel CT. CT, you have a very narrow x-ray beam, right? It's collimated at the source. There's a grid at the detector, and there's a huge air gap between the patient and the detector. In flat panel CT, the detector is enormous, Think about the field size. Think about the amount of the patient that's irradiated, and then think about how much scatter is reaching the detector. And then there's also ring artifacts. Another slide from Jeff showing rings, shading. Uh, so this is a result of scattered radiation, also called uh, cupping. Streak artifacts, motion artifacts, metal artifacts, lag artifacts from charge trapping in the flat panel detector. Flat panel detectors are pretty slow, compared to CT detectors, the ultra-fast ceramics. So there can be effects from residual signal. Truncation, the field of view is very small. And then the classic cone beam artifact. Uh, this is the link to this presentation. This slide came from awesome presentation on flat panel CT if you want to take a look. This is the DeFreeze Phantom, also called the FDK killer, uh, because it shows the weakness of the FDK algorithm for wide cone angle. And so this is a Teflon disc that's in the center plane. It's in the, um, uh, the, 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 the Z, Z equals zero plane. Um, and so it's at the center of the uh, cone beam. And it's reconstructed perfectly. As we move further and further along the Z axis, you see the blurring that's introduced by the uh, fact that the, the FDK algorithm doesn't return an exact solution uh, for anything that lies outside of the plane of the fan. And so there are corrections that have been measured and applied. We don't typically see it this severe. I also mention it because you may unintentionally measure this effect. If you're going to measure spatial resolution, center the line pair gauge in the center of the field of view. You know, the cat fan is a long fan. Of. If you put it off at the edge of the field of view, you could be measuring the cone angle artifact or the cone beam artifact and not measuring the, the, the spatial resolution of the system. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't know why I showed this. It's like a kindergartner made it. This is a DeFreeze Phantom made from CD. So you, it shows the same effect, not nearly as bad. You know, you can see that there are corrections. Uh, you have to be some distance along the Z-axis. But this is our flat panel CT system, and the cone beam artifact is still fairly significant um, on this system. Uh, streaks. So on the, which image came from a conventional CT scanner? The one on the left, right? The streak artifacts aren't nearly as bad as the images on the right. And this is because 
The images on the right are acquired with a limited angle implementation of CT. And so we get what we call view aliasing uh, because we're not sampling uh, these high frequency objects uh, in enough views in order to prevent aliasing. Um, and then also half band scanning or limited angle scanning results in the loss of conjugate rays as well, which are also useful uh, for, for dealing with artifacts. Here's an example of another type of artifact. Um, I don't know why the lines are here. So I show you the lines. The red one is the, the, the red image here, uh, the, uh, the, the Sagittal plane, and the green one is the coronal plane. So you get a bearing for where you are. And so you see this artifact, right? There's a linear artifact that runs down the center of this image. And what causes this artifact? It's the ring artifact, this tiny ring artifact in the center of the image. And so while it doesn't look like a big deal in the axial image, it certainly uh, affects every uh, part of the reformatted image. And so ring artifacts can be a big problem. Uh, sharpness in CT. So we looked at some artifacts, their causes. Um, and so what will we do for this ring artifact? How do we get rid of this? Have the engineer come in and redo the, the gain calibration, right? Not the gain, the I0 calibration. Siemens has two calibrations they do, the geometry calibration and an I0 calibration. That's done with a copper filter affixed to the, the, the collimator. And I'm sorry, I think actually placed somewhere between the, the collimator and the... I'm trying to think, it's been a long time since I've seen it. No, it's affixed to it. They do a rotational scan and then uh, they have their I0 calibration for a particular mode. Um, and so that can also... Uh, redoing that can get rid of ring artifacts uh, if you notice them in your images. And that's, again, done mode by mode. Sharpness in CT is influenced by a lot of factors. The matrix size, the field of view, the kernel, the detector configuration, so on, so on. In flat panel CT, the bin pixel size is 0.4 millimeters on our Dyna CT system. Uh, this gives you isotropic resolution for uh, multiplanar reconstruction. This is equivalent to a 21 and a half centimeter field of view in CT. And then we can also change the field of view. So I'm going to try to do this without looking at my notes and figure out what each of these images are. Okay, I know what these images are. So I'll zoom them in. And do you notice a difference in these images? Which image would you say is better? The right, right? So here, one, two, three, four, five. I see about the sixth line pair. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about eight, right? So this is why this evaluation, I think, is still useful. It's, it's fairly subjective. It's very simple. But this showed a big difference between two of our imaging systems. Anybody hazard a guess as to what the difference was? It was the kernel. So they had come in and upgraded our system and... Uh, upgraded, it still had this kernel available, but by default it used a smoother reconstruction kernel. And so we see this difference in the sharpness of the image. This was an interesting thing I discovered after one of our systems was updated. Here's an image from our older system. Here it is from the updated system. What's the difference in these two images? The matrix size. So the matrix size, all of a sudden during a software update, Went from 512 by 512 to 1024 by 1024. This is a big deal for us because we generate about, in a typical case that uses this, about a thousand axial images. That's a load on your network, and it's a lot more of a load when they're going at 1024 instead of 512. Uh, so the difference here, guess the difference. This, I believe, i got to look at my notes here. Yeah, th this is a 1024 on the left and a 512 on the right. Do you see any appreciable difference? No. Normally, I would expect the resolution to be much better for the larger matrix size, right? So what, I mean, so there must be something else going on, and resolution is also influenced by other factors, like the focal spot, right? So this is a pretty large magnification factor that we're using to acquire these data. Another interesting thing is what modality uh, or what uh, object type are your images sent? One was sent as CT, one was sent as XA. 
That influences the types of data that are in the header. Uh, here's another one with a 512 and a 1024. And uh, actually, no, this is a different VOI. So this is the normal VOI, the normal display field of view. This is a smaller display field of view. And if you zoom them up, I believe that you see a little more detail in the smaller one, uh, but, uh, but uh, not a drastic difference. So there are other things going on uh, that affect the resolution, like the focal spot size. We have to keep this in mind. Uh, cone beam artifact also blurs objects. Patient motion can be a problem. Uh, so if you're going to be doing a procedure uh, where you're doing a lot of Dyna CT, a patient that's not compliant, anesthetize them. Breathe for them. Noise and low contrast resolution. So low contrast resolution is virtually a non-starter in most implementations of flat panel CT. There is so much scatter uh, that affects the uh, that affects the uh, the contrast in the image. Flat detectors have more additive noise. The Dell size is smaller than a channel in CT. Uh, no bow tie filter. We're not doing a full rotation, and so we have to ask ourselves how are we using these images? So again, this is about 75% of the dose of CT. Here's a CT. Uh, I hate doing these in in different types of lighting, but you can see uh, you know many more objects here in this phantom. Uh, I should have displayed it as small thumbnails, right, based on what Phil said this morning, so you could see more uh, in your, the center of your, uh, your retina. Uh, we can improve it by increasing the dose per frame, but really it goes from, like, really bad to kind of bad, and, uh, you, know, that, you know, for what we use it for, we don't need it. The one case where you might look at this is neuro, right? If you're going to do neuro, the head is fairly small, and so we can crank up the dose per frame, and we can begin to see some, you know, Hounsfeld differences maybe in the 5 to 10 range and look at bleeds and things like that. Uh, so there is a role for that, but in most applications, you, you know, you're not going to hope to see much uh, in terms of low contrast in a flat panel CT image. And again, this is the scatter problem. We've got an enormous uh, X-ray field size, and so we have an enormous scatter to primary ratio. And, you know, there, there's nothing we can do about it. We put a grid there. We apply some image corrections for cupping, and, and we, we deal with it. This just ex exaggerates the cupping artifact. I took out the grid here uh, just to show you what that looks like. Motion can be a problem because the scan time is long. Um, we can reduce the scan time by reducing the angular sampling, by increasing the rotation speed. Uh, if you know That's a, a technological increase. But we always need a certain amount of data, and there's always trade-offs. Lag is not something that we've seen practical problems with. Um, if you, I, I think I have a slide about it. I'll talk about it later. But there, you know, charge trapping is the most significant effect. Afterglow is not really that significant. And so it can cause artifacts. But the way to get around this is to calibrate the panel like it's used. Uh, and so the variant OBI actually mentions this, that you should really hammer the panel before you calibrate it to saturate all these sites where charge is trapped, and so you, you, you get rid of that influence, right? Think about the way a case is done. There's a lot of irradiation of the detector before a, a, a flat panel CT study is acquired, and so by calibrating it like it's actually used, you, you don't tend to see these effects uh, in practice. Contrast, Phil elegantly explained this morning how KVP and filtration affect contrast. Scatter ruins contrast. But what are we doing? We're pumping their uh, vessels full of iodine. So I'm pretty sure we're not worried about a little scattered radiation. We're going to have plenty of contrast by the time we're done. Set your injection protocols to deliver the optimum contrast. And uh, then, of course, bid depth, processing, rendering, all affect contrast. Image on the left, you can't see anything in the liver. I don't think anyone will argue with me about that. But you inject some contrast in the vessels, and, oh, all of a sudden... I can see some pretty small vessels in this patient's liver. So don't get discouraged. Uh, think of how it's used, and in the interventional lab, it's used to acquire, in most cases, contrast-enhanced examinations. And I would argue I would pick this image over this image any day of the week for quantifying the vascular supply to this lesion. Would anybody pick this image for doing that? If I'm trying to find this lesion... I'm not going to look at this, all right? I'm not going to be able to do it. But if I'm trying to uh, plan a treatment for this lesion, 
I'm certainly taking the improved spatial resolution and sharpness over uh, the, the, uh, the, the low contrast. Here it is in a uh, coronal projection. And again, look at this. What is that? All right. So we have... Uh, <laughs> does that mean my time is up? Or what? <laughs> so we have, uh, uh, again, I think much more clear here uh, compared to here. Um, and so you can see the vascular supply uh, going to this tumor. And I believe I actually have a, um, a series of this. And so just look at the exquisite detail that we see all the small vessels, and we can very uh, accurately determine what branches of this vessel supply this tumor. Uh, and so, uh, you know, despite the fact that there's loads of scatter and that we can't, we don't have good low contrast detectability, uh, we're using these images uh, to find uh, the vascular supply to these tumors. We're reconstructing them as maximum intensity projections in a lot of cases. So don't worry about the fact that there's a lot of uh, scatter affecting the image. Uh, one, of the, and, you know, one of the biggest topics uh, that, that comes up is quantitative accuracy. Um, and physicians are always shocked when I go in. I, our interventional physicians are doing a CT guided biopsy. And there's a, they're waiting for pathology. So I'll drop a, a region of interest on the, you know, the, the part of the patient that's more uh, anterior and the part of the patient that's more superior in the same organ. And it's different. We place a lot of times too much faith in the quantitative abilities of CT. The CT number has some unique features because of how it's ca uh, calculated, but it is by no means an absolute quantity. And we do well to remember that in conventional CT, but it's, uh, it, it's even more different in flat panel CT. So CT number is affected by a lot of factors in conventional CT, uh, but again, keep in mind that a lot of implementations of flat panel CT don't rely on quantification using absolute CT numbers. Uh, there are some things like maybe replanning uh, where we could conceive that CT numbers might be used in a quantitative fashion. And Varian warned you about it. Anyone desiring to use them for planning or dose verification uh, should perform additional testing. As I mentioned, Varian does a CT number calibration. And this is why, in a slide I'll show, and I'll skip to because uh, we're, we're running a little short on time, this is why the CT numbers married, uh, measured on the Varian system correspond to actual CT and the real CT numbers quite well because they perform this CT number calibration that applies this shift uh, to, uh, to the, the reconstructed CT numbers. Uh, on the Dyna CT, with two different reconstruction kernels, uh, you can see the CT numbers uh, do not match actual CT numbers nearly as well. And so uh, for this system, we don't use the CT numbers for absolute quantification. If I wanted to use the ones on the variant system for replanning, I might could very well do that uh, because the CT numbers are fairly accurate, but I'd also need to get some information on are they constant, um, do they vary within the field of view, uh, and things like this. Uh, this shows that the CT number varies within the field of view, and quite drastically. So if we measure the CT number in different parts, so I, I don't have the, the this phantom was a, a gelatin phantom, a big uh, cylindrical phantom, and it's like position one, two, three, four, five. So it's around the outside and in the center. And so it varies because of, you know, several facts. The the scan is not a full 360. Um, you know, there's no CT number calibration. Uh, what we've been doing lately is what work on what we call relative contrast enhancement or relative enhancement. And so we said, well, you know, if we want to quantitatively plan treatments on our interventional lab, if the CT numbers are constant over time, which isn't an absolute with a flat panel detector, um, then we can possibly use it. So they are constant over time. And so we can measure the CT number in a lesion and the background in an unenhanced image, and then in an enhanced image, measure it in exactly the same place. Because the CT number in exactly the same place doesn't change. And by doing this, I can calculate the relative enhancement, dividing the enhancement in the tumor 
by the enhancement in the background. Both have different baseline CT numbers, but I'm using this difference method, and I can quantitatively uh, estimate the contrast uptake in a tumor. Uh, image uniformity is expectedly poor uh, because of the scattered radiation, limited angle of rotation, lack of a bow tie filter, and so we don't expect that if we go in and drop five ROIs in a uniform phantom, we're going to get uh, a, a good result on a uniformity test. So maybe measure it at baseline, measure it as a constancy check, but don't get bent out of shape if the CT numbers are not uniform across the image. Uh, so we got about one or two minutes left before we hit the hour. Um, I can just base, quickly show you a few clinical uses. Uh, this is verifying the therapeutic endpoint. Uh, so was the entire tumor loaded with the therapeutic agent? Angiographically occult lesions, maybe there's something here. Very difficult, actually impossible to see on this angiogram. Maybe a hint of it here on the, the flat panel CT that is uh, very nicely uh, delineated. Uh, Pre-planning for large lesions. Um, this is a dose-saving technology at times, right? Instead of going in there and doing 25 DSA runs to find out which branches supply the tumor, we do one Dyna CT at a very uh, super selective uh, location, and then we can look at this uh, with the right injection protocol and plan the attack. Then we go here, do an angiogram, treat, angiogram, treat, angiogram, treat. So we limit the number of angiograms we do by planning off the Dyna CT data. Endpoint assessment. This tumor didn't get a full load. Uh, because maybe that vessel was uh, already blocked where it supplied the tumor. Maybe there's another vessel that supplies it. This was a really cool case I saw a couple weeks ago. And uh, a little backstory: this this was one of the nicest ladies I've ever met. I talked to her for a long time. She had a very long procedure. Who knows what a lymphangiogram is? So they spend a long time dissecting her feet to find lymph nodes and and uh, and vessels in the lymphatic chain. Um, they, they put very, very fine, I think it's like 30, 32 gauge needles in these vessels. These things are like tiny, tiny. And they use very oily ethiodol contrast. They flip the contrast bottles up, put big weights on them. Uh, they're in syringes to slowly push the contrast. And they're following it as it goes up her lymphatic chain because she's just had surgery uh, and her thoracic duct was severed. And so this means she has very bad lymphedema um, because of this. And so they're going to go in, and, and they went in and tried to repair it, and now they're going to go in and try to embolize a certain part of the thoracic duct to relieve her symptoms. So this is the lymphangiogram. And so think about this now. So what the interventionist is going to do, I talked to him, is he's going to go in and percutaneously try to puncture this cisterna chile, and put a catheter in and go up here. What lies between this lady's skin and her cisterna chile? All manner of things you don't want to poke. And so what we did is... No, now, this, this really shows the power of this, right? A CT scanner doesn't have the ability to navigate dynamically like fluoroscopy. So we put her on the table, did a Dyna CT, identifies where he wants to puncture looks at critical structures in the path, and then punctures, threads the needle into the cisterna chile, uh, puts a guide wire in, and then puts the catheter. All right, And so this is, this is not a common procedure, but this is a powerful use of this technology to really benefit a patient. Dental CT, of course, uh, radiation oncology alignment, uh, so 3D, 3D shifts uh, using uh, the planning data and the, uh, the images of the patient acquired, with the flat panel CT uh, on the day of the treatment. Uh, Peter Balter uh, graciously supplied me with this slide. So that's some clinical uses. I'd like to acknowledge Peter Balter, who spent a lot of time with me uh, on the variant system. Um, Jeff Sewardson, uh, who is always generous with some of his content, and, uh, and he works with the iStar Lab at Johns Hopkins. And Mike Wallace, one of our interventional radiologists, who gave me some slides. Thank you.